A lot of times that can relate to like how I believe I'm going to succeed is just rowing harder, doing more work, right? You can get into this important, like not great trap. And you mentioned either, even Mm -hmm. like I've got a lot of responsibility. I'm just going to work harder. I will tell you that is not the keys to the door to the C-suite. Welcome to the She's So Sweet podcast, where we interview accomplished women who have worked their way to the C-suite. I'm your host, Christy Feltaruso, Chief Customer Officer and award-winning customer success executive. I am so thrilled to introduce today's guest, Catherine Blackmore, the GVP of Oracle Applications Service Excellence. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the show. Oh, Christy, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I am so thrilled. I am sad that we had to reschedule, but I am so happy that we were able to find a time that worked and get our get it rescheduled for us. Oh, absolutely. I am really looking forward to this conversation. Um, a big fan of everything you're doing, Christy. So happy to be here to talk about my background and how I can help the community of listeners here. Oh, awesome. Well, I know that they're going to learn a ton in this episode, so I'm so excited to jump right in. Why don't we get started? Why don't we tell folks a little bit about Oracle? Let's share a little bit about what your role entails. It is a meaty title. And so let's unpack that and really learn a little bit more about what you're doing at Oracle today. Absolutely. So I have the pleasure, the privilege, and great responsibility of waking up every day and thinking about how are we going to drive our customers and our employees' success. So Oracle is one of the largest software companies in the world, technology companies. Um, Obviously, um, Larry Ellison himself is quite the iconic technology leader. I'm sure many people have seen him, um, have have, uh, even maybe seen technology on uh, movies like Iron Man. Um, So uh, hopefully this is almost a household brand at this point. But if not, um, we were founded in 1977 and went public in 1986. And uh, now at a point where we have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of customers, um, and obviously a very large organization, but specifically what I do. So I am in our fusion development organization and then Oracle as a technology provider. This is the part of the organization that focuses on our software as a service, our business applications. And my responsibility in driving customer and employee success is really thinking about the ending connection we're having um, in development and support and success and working with our customers. And so I am focused on developing the programs that enable us to have long-term relationships, whether it's at scale, like many folks that are in the world of customer success or support or services, how do you deliver at scale, as well as how do you have a very personalized approach working with customer executives? And how do you build that empathy, whether it's within the support experience or even as we develop products? Um, That's on the customer side, but then it quickly translates into employees. As I have said, as my mantra for years, Christy, there's no way we can drive customer success without employee success. So equally important, I spend a lot of time thinking about how do we train future leaders? How do we train our people to better serve our customers? How do we train executives? And how do we make sure we have the best employee experience? Because that's where we truly can deliver incredible experiences for our customers. Oh my gosh. I love that. Um, I don't know if you came up with that, but I've definitely used that term. I've stolen it from someone along the way, but I couldn't agree more with you. Let's tell me a little bit about what does your organization look like? So how many teams, how many people, like how many of those fall into your organization? Yeah. So I am a part of our application service excellence organization, which is about 3000 global employees. And, you know, certainly with having that many individuals that are in different countries, different cultures, um, even different roles, is really important to think about the experience that we're creating for our customers. And then in addition to that, um, I have the responsibility to really collaborate and work cross-functionally with all of our development pillar leaders, whether it's our HCM software, supply chain software, ERP, um, EPM. I mean, we have a number of applications that helps our uh, companies obviously run and operate their businesses in the cloud. And so I work you know, shoulder to shoulder with those leaders around how we're actually delivering success to our customers and what are the programs we have to have in place to be you know, better enabled to listen to our customers, serve them, as well as um, connect with our executives. And then, of course, Christy, how do we do that at scale? You know, given that we're in the development organization, we're constantly thinking about how do we provide those experiences in such a way that customers don't need to call or ping or, or right. file a ticket? How can I actually be in the application or in a control plane where I can just self-serve myself? And then we spend a lot of time investing in our Oracle community, our cloud customer connect community. 
And how do we actually deliver best practice content and all the things that we would deliver with a success leader or a success manager or support engineer? How do we actually place that in a community experience so customers connect with each other? Well, you are solving the problem that is top of mind for so many leaders in our space and customer success. And I know everyone's trying to figure that out. So maybe we connect again and talk about how you're doing that because you probably yeah. have a lot more experience than most on how do you create those experiences at scale. It's something that a lot of folks are trying to figure out today. Now, I want to take it back a little bit. So we're going to, we talked about your current role, but as I always say, right, I cannot imagine a world where as a little girl, maybe you were thinking, when I grow up, I want to be the GVP of application service excellence. Oh so when you think back to to younger Catherine, what what was it like? What were your career aspirations? What were some of the things that drove you or in your early days? Oh, you know, I, I think about a lot about this and we'll talk in a little bit about the individuals I mentored Oracle, but I was asked a version of this question too, not long ago. And it really made me think. And I think as you you know, get further along in your career, you start making connections. You know, what are the patterns of how I've kind of seen my career progress or how did it get started very early? And as I I think about that, Christy, it kind of falls into a couple of different areas. Um, uh, Maybe six or five or six year old Catherine was all about, you know, puzzles, solving problems, as well as innovation. And I didn't know what that word was back then, or I did, or it just wasn't connected with what a career would look like. Um, But also leadership. Um, I was the oldest of four siblings, I mean, I think it's important to note, I was the child of two STEM parents. Um, My father was a great atmospheric scientist. He's retired now. Um, My mother graduated like second in her class and was a chemistry and math major. And of course, that was very much encouraged. Um, I was very strong math student, um, definitely analytically minded, able to, you know, accelerate at math. However, one thing that might have been a little different um, with versus me and some of my siblings and maybe even my parents is I also had a very strong English background as well, very early reader. And so what it looked like for me as a little girl, um, I would write my own stories and illustrate my own stories. Very creative. Um, I would create plays and and dramas (laughs) that we would play out with my friends and I would kind of lead that whole experience. Um, But I also love solving problems. Um, Now, of course, that will age me, but that's okay. With age comes wisdom. Um, But I got one of the first Rubik's Cubes. I think it came out in 1980. And here I am, I think 11 years old, um, have a Rubik's Cube. And, and I had a fun party trick with my relatives. And so that summer, I learned how to solve the Rubik's Cube. And it was novel. You know, people are just, I would bring it with me on our family road trips. And so as we stopped off and visited family, I was like, oh, you've got one of those Rubik's Cubes. I pay you $20 if you can solve right. it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. So I like, you know, maybe like 10 minutes later, I'm like, there you go. So I racked up quite a bit of uh, cash, let's say, to buy Barbies that summer. So um, that was like young me. Um, But then, you know, you got to think about the time in which I graduated. Oracle and Microsoft, interestingly enough, both IPO'd one day from each other a year before I graduated. So, you know, when you think about careers, that would have been high risk. Um, I come from a family that, you know, maybe wouldn't have had me take that kind of risk. These folks, uh, my parents weren't startup entrepreneurs. And then engineering wise, you know, I don't know folks still do this these days, but I took one of these like high school tests that tell you what your career could look like, what you should do. Mine came back yep. as engineer. Okay. Probably. Oh, no really? surprise, but it came back as engineer and I didn't really want to be an atmospheric scientist. And then, you know, you think about computer sciences, probably IBM, maybe HP were like the careers that you would think of, but like, keep in mind, creative. I love to write and create yeah. things and solve problems. Well, if you look at like the UI and UX of those days, green screen, Christy, Pac-Man, <laughs> Space Invaders for gaming. Um, and then, oh, and I had the first, like my, my high school graduation gift was the first version of the Macintosh computer. When you logged on the novel graphic interface, the UI was a script that said, hello. Wow. So inspiring. I definitely <laughs> signed me up. I want a career there. Um, but the other thing too, that I think a lot about is leadership. Um, Cause that's the other thing. Not only was my father and is my, my father is a brilliant scientist. Um, he had a career unlike others in management and leadership. And I observed that, you know, constantly a student of my family. And I asked my dad, you know, he's someone that I go to for always, you know, as a sounding board. And he said, you know, the thing that really separated me, Catherine, was my ability to kind of bring people together, lead a team and as a great communicator. And again, oldest of four, I kind of, sought out leadership opportunities, a couple other fun facts. Um, I chose being the yearbook editor my senior year, not because, I mean, I 
I, I knew that I could lead this, but I also thought our yearbook sucked. It was terrible. I wanted to look like the magazines that I would look at and graphic design wise, right, I right, really right. pushed the envelope. I pushed, you know, Jostens, I think was our provider then. I mean, they yep. would create like really like simple, you know, layouts that everybody just followed. I'm sorry, what a terrible product we were selling to the to the whole student body. And so I And they weren't the cheap. <laughs> No, they weren't. And so I listened. <laughs> I listened to all of my peers like, Catherine, we have to have a much better high school year, but come on. I mean, there's pressure, like make this the best ever. Um, but I hand did all the layouts, really created the whole different look and feel of this product and really got my whole team around that concept that pushed the envelope, even our advisor. So I knew I, Christy, I had this innate sense of leadership, kind of call to leadership. And so as my father told me what he knew was differentiated, um, I really thought, you know, how do I apply all my strengths? And so at that point in time, it was a degree in communications and a degree in psychology. And while, wow, you know, how did that lead to where I am now? I'm sure we can get into some of that, but I think the fact that that's to me fundamental of how you actually lead an organization, communicate, um, having that knowledge, having that expertise, um, quite frankly, Christy, I use it every single day. Of course you do. The, it's so interesting because I've, I've now, this is probably episode 14 of of these conversations. And it's so interesting to see what folks had went to school for versus what they're doing. Now, again, this podcast I've met with CIOs, CTOs, CPOs, CEOs, like just uh, the gamut. And so many of them have educational backgrounds and things like communications, PR, things like that. And they talk about how, despite that, that's not where their career led them to, the skills that they learned through their education early on is so critical to their success. So it's so interesting to hear you talk about that as well. That's right. And, you know, and I certainly found that too. I mean, when I was recruited, I worked for companies like Nestle and Kellogg's when I first got out of college. And again, you know, there's a bridge to getting to technology from there, which I can explain, but, you know, those were you know, let's just say I wasn't necessarily inspired to go work for Big Blue. It wasn't what I really wanted to do when you're thinking about technology. And again, like I mentioned, Microsoft and, and I went to University of Washington, so they're right in our backyard. But again, it was still kind of risky to even think about working for that company. And so I went to go work for a household brand, Nestle. You know, who doesn't know who Nestle is? And certainly my parents were excited about that. Um, but, you know, the thing about that opportunity was really about, you know, also developing leadership. I was recruited in as a management development candidate. We'll probably talk more about that in a little bit. But, you know, some of the things that I did, I think, really set me up for further success. And then pattern matching, because I've always been true to what I really love to do, which is solving problems, really being innovative. You know, the, you know, young teenager me, you know, revolutionizing how we actually put a yearbook together. There are other things I did throughout my career journey that really taught me that, that eventually certainly led me to a GVP of Application Service Excellence and being a part of customer success. Well, great. So you already started to talk about this, right? Like your your first role at Nestle. But as you reflect on your career journey, what were some of those pivotal moments or the decisions that you feel most contributed to the, your professional success? Yeah, I think as I mentioned a minute ago, I think I had true a true north around what I knew I was good at. And I had confidence in some of those skills. Now, how did I put it into play? I mean, that really required some help of others. Um, I always think about, you know, when you go to work for a company, I think that it's important that you make the decision around is this company going to provide me not just with a great opportunity today, salary, comp plan, interesting work, but what's your personal plan? What's the, I call it the game within a game. If you're a fan of basketball, you know, as I've learned over the years, like like there's the game of on the court, but then there's also the individual players on the, on the court and how they're playing each other and how they're defending each other. And I think about that maybe totally different context, but within the career aspect, you know, having your personal growth in mind at the same time, you're thinking about the job I'm going to do today. And so I think that was, you know, gosh, I look back and say, I'm pretty wise at that young age of thinking, you know, this company I'm going to go work for, I also want to grow personally, you know, Nestle and eventually Kellogg's. I mean, those are companies that are brand names that actually put a lot of investment in their employees. And the fact that I was on a management development track, I mean, I was interviewing that company as much as they were interviewing me. I knew that they were going to expose me to things that I thought were pretty interesting and, you know, very curious about participating in that. And then I think the other things too, that um, I know have been really helpful for me would be the leaders I work for. I think you need to know, you know, which leaders I think, you know, ultimately are going to see you for more than who you are. 
And sometimes when you're first getting started, maybe you don't know that. Maybe you end up working for someone that, you know, just isn't fitting. And we can talk more about this, Christy, but maybe there's a change I need to make. I think I've had a good kind of sixth sense around, you know, your personal walkaway points of when you know that this maybe isn't the person that's going to help you grow. So let's get to a leader that's really going to help me grow. And then I think it's all, you know, company, the leader you're working for. And then to me, it's about signing up for those stretch assignments. Sometimes it's not just the job we're doing today, but it could be an opportunity that you see the company needs to take advantage of, or it's something that you know your leader needs help with. Whenever I would be in my one-on-ones or in my conversations with my leaders, I'd always be asking, what, what can I help you with? What can I help you with? And the fact that they invested in me, they knew that I had strengths. I was given opportunities, Christy, to go beyond what my current role was. And it was in those opportunities. Hey, Catherine, when I was working at Consumer Packaged Goods, you know, I think we want to test how to bring forward a private label pet food. I kid you not, a private label pet food to Albertsons. Can you help lead that? Oh, sign me up. I want to figure out how to do that. It's going to get me exposed to how the supply chain of us producing something and having packaging and and creating a brand, how that works. And then how did that translate into taking that to a retailer and making that happen? I'm just wanting to learn, just consume how something that's different than what I do every day, you know, how can that help me grow? Um, I was asked very early at Kellogg's, you know, yes, I have the background of being very analytical. I've done analyst jobs. Um, but I was also, I realized, recruited because my leader, while he was okay, decent on Excel, he really needed my help, you know, being able to explain our, you know, quarterly results. And so I would fly with him to Battle Creek, Michigan and it was the future CEO of the company, but I didn't know at the time, I was asked to help him present our quarterly results. And what were the findings? What was our p &L? You know, All of those results, I think, were something that I got exposed to and helped communicate. Um, but that was my grounding, Christy, before I even got into technology. And I was recruited into technology as a leader. And it was really those kind of foundational skills that got me there. That's so interesting. So I, I just recorded another episode earlier today. Um, so, and, and one of the things that she talked about was being proactive, right. And raising your hand and taking on those opportunities, which is exactly what you talked about with these stretch assignments. And I'm going to ask you what I asked her and I want to hear your advice here. I agree. And that is part of, I think how I, how I have navigated my own success. However, we've seen over the past year, tons of companies go through a lot of rifts, right. Reduces in force, a lot of layoffs, leaving teams as skeleton crews, where fee people are feeling overworked, overextended, they've got a lot on their plate. How would you advise somebody who is kind of at their capacity to navigate this as an opportunity, right? How do you, what would you say to them or advise them so that they know, you know, there is still an opportunity for you to do this stuff given your situation? So like, how, how might you advise them? Oh, yes. I think a lot about that because first of all, congratulations if you're part of the skeleton crew. In some regards, because right, that means the least, vital yeah. organization. And then there are many, many careers birthed out of battlefield promotions, um, meaning that you know you're going to have an opportunity to stretch and grow and get exposed to things that maybe you wouldn't be if it was a scaled team. So, you know, my advice and recommendation would be: you've got to figure out how to manage the day to day. Be smart. Try to be efficient. You know, and for a lot of people, honestly, there's just a lesson to be learned around prioritization of what's urgent versus what isn't as urgent. And I think sometimes, especially when you've got your fingers in everything, you know, you want to do everything. And I think you have to be very smart and very targeted. And even if you need help to clarify what is most critical of the day, you know, leaders just have to do the same thing. And so you can definitely get great advice from the leaders around you, or even ask, you know, people outside of the company of how to do that, because the ability for you to free up capacity for additional work, additional stretch assignments or leadership work, or things that are going to help you open the door to the next opportunity, that's what you got to make time for. That's such great advice. Okay, now I want to I want to pivot a little bit more here. The She's So Sweet podcast is brought to you by Client Success. Client Success is an all-in-one customer success platform to help post-sale implementation and success teams manage customers from new to renew. Through an industry-leading platform approach, Client Success gives businesses an in-depth view into customer health, product usage trends, along with churn and risk data so that your team can not only retain customers, but help them grow as well. 
Whether it's managing customer onboarding workflows in shared portals, building custom health scores, tracking sentiment with NPS surveys, or doing more with less through AI and automations, Client Success gives customer success professionals a true one-stop platform to manage all aspects of the customer journey. To learn more about the industry's fastest to implement customer success platform, visit www.clientsuccess.com. That's Client Success, simple, powerful customer success. I want to talk about some of the obstacles, right? Because we all know that there is no straight linear path to the top. So share with us a little bit about some of those battle scars, right? What were those significant challenges or obstacles that you faced professionally and, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I think um, I will be very transparent on this and vulnerable about all of it because that's the only way I think that you everyone can grow out of this. And I think it's one that I didn't have the experience of being with a female role model that was vulnerable with me to even share with me. So I'm hoping that I can provide this gift with all of you. Um, and that is the first struggle. And I can name it now. I wasn't able to name it back then. The first thing is overcoming your worst enemy, which is your own internal mind, the own thoughts you give yourself, it's your inner critic. And, you know, we have a name for it now, probably didn't, you know, a number of years ago, but that's the first major hurdle, which is, you know, I'm Christy, I'm a perfectionist. I'm constantly trying to solve problems. Sometimes I'm not giving myself enough credit for the problems I've already solved because yeah. I'm trying to get to the next one. And I just, you know, I, I will sometimes beat myself down by the words I have in my brain. And the first thing is just to really figure out how to overcome it. You know, how do I get out of that negative narrative that gets in my way, that tells me sometimes I'm not good enough. I can't do this. There's other people that are better than me. I'm not worth it. Um, and I think sometimes like a trick for that too, by the way, is to actually say what it is that's running through your brain, but don't do it, just do it to yourself. Have, have a friend, a colleague, a mentor, you know, say it to them because sometimes, you know, there is this psychological moment where if you say it out loud, your rational brain will not accept that. It just won't. But in your brain, it makes total sense. It makes total sense that I'm incapable, incompetent, can't do this, won't do this, going to fail. Um, oh my goodness. You know, we got to get out of our own way. And the, honestly, Christy, the also damaging part about it is over half of uh, you know, more than 50% of women struggle with this more than men is this whole imposter yep. syndrome. And so that is a huge barrier I, I'll share more in a little bit about what we're doing, you know, what I'm doing now to really help women with that in particular, but just getting over that is a huge hurdle. And I've done that. I mean, I've done that through mentors, through some of the things that we can talk about in a little bit about techniques. That's one thing. And another big solve for this aloe vera of your own brain is also being able to know what your superpowers are. It's your personal brand. And, and yes, I've had a degree in this. I understand a lot about marketing and branding overall, but maybe not within the application of your personal brand. And so being able to really think about your own unique superpowers, what do I bring? What do I offer that's unique and different? Um, and, and I also will talk a little bit about, I think sometimes as women, um, we don't spend enough time there thinking about our personal brand. That's also been a very big, important piece. And then, as I mentioned a little bit ago, the leaders, the mentors, the sponsors, the sponsors are the ones that are going to help connect you to that X opportunity. The mentors are the ones that are going to coach you and help you realize you're more than what you probably think you are today. Just seeking those leaders out. And at first, oh gosh, back in the day, it probably wasn't a thing where we had mentors. Um, but I think I just naturally gravitated towards people that could help me. And that was also really an important key to my success in overcoming what I just described. I mean, it's amazing. Um, the themes between all of the successful leaders I've had the privilege of, of speaking with say these same things, right? The asking for help theme has come up in so many conversations. In fact, that's what people say is like, if I could offer a piece of advice, make sure you're asking for help. I wish I had a, I had done this earlier. I felt more comfortable with it. So I love that you, you so clearly articulated to that. Obviously the imposter syndrome thematic as well. Um, and it's amazing to see that despite the imposter syndrome that we all navigate, all of these folks have been wildly successful in their careers like yourself. So it's, it's I think, really reassuring for folks like myself and others who are trying to figure out like how to get there and how to combat those thoughts that we have, that inner critic you talked about. So thank you so much for sharing that. Now, I do want to go back because you did say we don't spend enough time talking about our successes and you don't spend enough time thinking about all the impact that you've driven professionally over the years and all your roles 
So we're going to spend some time doing that. This is your moment to pat yourself on the back and toot your horn. And so I want to spend some time. I want to hear about those successes. So when you look back professionally over the years, what would you say are your proudest moments or those accomplishments that you're like, yes, I did that? Yeah, I, just how I roll. There's many things that certainly anyone would say, gosh, that was amazing. You were able to launch this or build that or make this big goal or thing that no one thought was possible happen. And of course, I'm very proud of those moments. You know, the fact that we've been able to build a success model at Oracle at scale that is developed and being implemented globally. Um, that was a huge undertaking, many, many hours and collaborating with others in order to make that real. Um, but Christy, what probably I think is my most rewarding and fulfilling accomplishment are the people that I've been able to work with, had the pleasure to mentor along the way. The fact that I can think back to my days in consumer packaged goods and knowing that I was able to mentor and coach people that were direct reports of me and help them get to the where they wanted to go professionally and to be able to see where their careers are. You know, knowing that I've helped launch future, you know, general managers of companies. Um, and then even within SaaS, I mean, early days, you know, customer success was not what it is today when I first got started in technology. Nope. And, you know, as an early pioneer and framer in the space, having some of those early first leaders work for me, you know, we're talking these, these, these individuals are GMs, CROs, CCOs. Um, it's incredible to me to be a part of their career journey and to be able to see that they've, you know, been able to accelerate and take some of the early learnings and even, you know, meeting back up with them again professionally and taking them from what they've started and working with me as a director and helping them realize their professional goals of becoming a VP. Chrissy, that's where I take the greatest amount of pride, honestly. It's what I also feel compelled to do even moving forward is being able to not just share these with people that are working directly for me, but with others. It truly is about paying it forward and helping develop the future. I mean, there's no greater gift than the one that you're giving to the folks around you. And obviously, it's very clear you're a selfless, a selfless leader. So thank you so much for all you're doing and for the foundation you've led for Folks like myself in the customer success space, obviously you've blazed a trail there and we're all super inspired by that. Now, you did talk about the help and support that you've given to women and other professionals. And so I always say, I, I love the saying, empowered women empower women. Yes. So how are you How are you leading out with that? How are you empowering other women as they take on leadership or, or they're just focused on their own career growth? Definitely. Well, it, it definitely got started early. You know, I, you know, we see the gaps, we see the challenges. Um, I've even talked about this. I mean, even challenging recruiters to not just go after individuals that, you know, aren't outside of the organization. How are we developing women within companies so they're ready to kind of grab the ring and take responsibility and be a part of, you know, the C-suite? Um, we need to do a lot. And so within Oracle, you know, what I've been just incredibly just grateful of being a part of is Oracle Women's Leadership. We have an employee resource group that's very large, great following. OWL um, is the acronym. Um, and also, even within the fusion development organization, Steve Miranda, who leads our entire fusion development, has really invested in women's leadership. So um, not only do I do this ad hoc and mentoring others, but we have formal mentoring programs. And we were able to build foundational leader around building a whole learning path around how to help women overcome barriers that they have and really, really help them achieve their unlimited potential. So things like managing your inner critic, developing confidence. How do I develop my personal brand? How do I develop executive presence? You know, those are all things that um, I've been able to help build the content around, help provide the facilitation and the experience around having discussions with women about this, tips, techniques, things that women can go do. And, you know, honestly, Christy, we should have done it 20 years ago, but I am happy that we are doing this now. And we're starting to see, you know, real results. And, and I'm happy to talk about them. I think, you know, the things that I've talked to women about, let's just talk about inner critic, like we mentioned a minute ago, you know, how do I even think about that? You know, the first thing is, honestly, you got to get to the root of what caused you to even have an inner voice and inner critic. And I've been pretty transparent about mine. You know, when I lost my mom, when I was 20 years old, I lost my cheerleader, my woman role model. I mentioned, I did not have a female role model in the workplace. You know, everyone I worked for with men. Um, not, I mean, they were amazing allies, but I didn't have that person I could turn to. And so when you lose someone like that very early in life, all of a sudden, I, you know, I, I got a parent myself. And unfortunately, as a, a young woman who's, you know, strives for great achieve, achievement, um, I can be pretty, pretty critical of myself. And I just didn't have my mom there to say, 
will you stop talking to yourself that way? Come on. You know, you know, you have so much more to offer. That is not what I raised you to do to talk to yourself that way. I didn't have that in me. Um, and I think it's just common, but I think even that accelerated or exasperated it. So for me, Christy, learning how to have that kind of parenting conversation, how do you understand the root of your inner critic, know how it gets triggered, how mine gets triggered is when I'm actually working with the other side of inner critic, which are overly critical of others. Now, there's many reasons why people are overly critical of others. Um, and I think the job sometimes is to get really curious about why that happens. But if you're really harsh on yourself and you're working with somebody that's really harsh on you, that is just a really toxic relationship and it is kryptonite. Yep. And so just knowing that that's also something that I know for myself, I, I, can't, I can't operate in that capacity or I have to learn how to get over that. So techniques are, how do I actually take what I have in my brain, put it out there, say it and have somebody else listen to me help, you know, kind of, wow, that I can't believe I said that to myself. But then how do you develop the skills? Having some voice inside, just like the person on your shoulder that says, please don't talk to my friend Catherine that way. Catherine's awesome. Catherine's amazing. So that's, you know, a huge part of it. And there's many other techniques um, that we won't have time to talk about today. But I think yeah, another I part of it that helps is knowing your superpower. I spend a lot of time talking with women at Oracle about uncovering your superpowers. This is around personal branding. And I think a lot of times we kind of think, well, unless I'm just graduating for the first time, getting out in the workforce, or maybe I'm getting a new job, you know, that maybe is important because no one knows me. I need to network and need to let people wear, you know, know who I'm all about. Christy, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Every day when I'm on a call and introduce myself, that's an opportunity to showcase my personal brand. You know, anytime yep. that I'm networking, getting to know somebody, even casually, how am I representing my personal brand? And I think sometimes we confuse your personal brand with your credibility. Your credibility is what I'm known for. I can deliver. I'm reliable. I'm competent. I mean, those words, you know, I, I deliver great results. But here's the thing, you know, that's not personal brand. Personal brand is, if, if you know, if I were to say, Christy, you and I are, are getting to know each other. I'd say, you know, so far, Christy, what I've observed to you is you've got incredible empathy, charisma, passion for what you're doing. Um, nowhere did I say in that, Christy, you know, you run this organization, you deliver results. Right. Um, that's, that's really not what defines you as a personal brand. And so there's some great exercises where you can actually ask yourself what you believe to be some of those capabilities, but then ask others how they see you. And the bit in the middle of the intersect is what your personal brand is. Um, it's important work. And then the last thing I will say that we spend a lot of time on, and is personally, I guess, a bit of a soapbox I get on. So inner critic, a lot of times that can relate to like how I believe I'm going to succeed is just Growing harder, doing more work, right? You can get into this important, like not great trap. And you mentioned either, even mm -hmm. like I've got a lot of responsibility. I'm just going to work harder. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that is not the keys to the door to the C-suite. That is not what will help get you promoted. What gets you promoted is more centered around your personal brand, how you think, what are your unique strengths and differences? And women as leaders, I'm telling you, I was, I was so, I've been so disappointed and I've been so also curious as to why don't we help each other more? I'm sure oh many goodness. of us on the call yep. have heard, you know, probably the person that I have the hardest relationship with is another woman leader in my company, or the hardest woman I've ever, or a person I've ever worked for is another woman. Why is that, Christy? Why is that? Well, I have a theory about this, and this is something we've got to change. And that is, I think it can stem from a scarcity model especially if we believe that there are not as many opportunities for women versus men. Okay. Right. Scarcity model. If we have a propensity to have this inner critic, where we're more critical of ourselves than you know, we should be. And we also believe that if we just row harder, we're going to, we're just going to outperform. We're just going to out row the men, Christy. We're just going to do a much harder job and we're going to get into the C-suite that way. Well, then it just becomes a zero sum game. I win, yep. you lose. I'm going to out row Christy this year. Or she's going to out row me. And oh my goodness, I better hop on my boat and go faster. That is not what your personal brand is about. That is not what's going to open the doors to C-suite. It is about understanding that we all have unique gifts to offer. And if we look at the world that way, and if we look at each other that way, opportunity to help each other is endless. It is, doesn't have constraints because you do things, Christy, I could never go do. And I want to support that and help nurture it and help you be able to be the best, amazing human leader that you are. Same with me. We are not competing with one, one another we should be supporting one another. And that is also something that I am just tirelessly going to work on to make sure that we can try to eradicate that situation. These are new behaviors though, Catherine. You raise a really good point. I feel like growing up professionally myself, 
companies pitted women against each other because there yeah. were there, that scarcity model you talk about. There were so few opportunities that it was almost intentional and by design that it created a competitive space. And sadly, that's kind of the environment that I grew up in professionally. And I felt like I had to fight for every opportunity. And to your point, it meant in order for me to win, someone else has to lose. But I will say never, never to this date have I seen so many women actually supporting women now. So I do think that we are at a a point in time where people are shifting their behaviors and it's probably due to a multitude of reasons. But it's part of why I started this podcast, right? It's like, how do we elevate the voices of women who are supporting other women? And how do we amplify those messages? And how do we just all win together? And it's kind of like that rising tide lifts all boats, right? Like, let's all be successful together. To your point, you've got strengths. You're going to have things that I can't do. I might have things that you can't excel at. And it's okay. We can all be successful and nobody has to lose in this, in this kind of new mindset. It's so true. I am excited about the future. I think the landscape has shifted. And I know we didn't talk about, I also do a lot of work around helping women in particular develop executive presence and the new rules of executive presence. Thank goodness are changed. It's no longer about, you know, you look like um, in a certain way or you wear certain clothes or, you know, certain height. <laughs> Can't believe it. Um, it's, it's way different now. And I think the number one thing that we see of leaders in the future are that we're visionary and that we're empathetic and that we have a really high EQ. And I think these are some of the natural traits that we can actually bring to the C-suite that's very different than maybe some of our male counterparts, um, but also help influence and help our male allies actually continue to grow in this area. But Christy, of course, you know, the negative downside of this is when we compete and when we actually just unfortunately step on others. We're not lifting people up or stepping on the shoulders or pushing them down. We're not giving opportunities to develop the future leaders of the future. And it's why, you know, I think it just continues to perpetuate, but couldn't be more excited about this podcast and what we're trying to do to help improve that. I agree. Well, now I want to, I want to go back for a moment. So like, if you were able to offer your, you've, you've learned so much, right? You come with so much wisdom and you're already sharing all of it. I'm like, I feel like each question could be its own podcast here. (laughs) Is there a piece of advice that you wish you had received earlier in your career? And what do you feel like having that advice? What would that have changed for you? Yeah, definitely. And I think now we all have the benefit of um, the internet (laughs) and, you know, having more visibility and being able to having information at our fingertips. And so, you know, if I were just getting started now, um, knowing what I know now, I would definitely say, seek out others, you know, have the have the individuals that you aspire to become. I mean, there's, who are those, you know, leaders or individuals that you really admire, you know, and, and, and why, and like, just spend time in that space. But then, you know, if you can reach out to them, try to, you know, find out how they got to where they went. This podcast is a great example of that. Um, And then, you know, being able to just reflect, I mean, gosh, I wish I would have been able to have watched the podcast of Amy Cuddy, around, I don't know if you've seen it, Christy, but it's power posing, you know, developing your confidence, right? I mean, I wish I would have watched that way earlier. I wish I would have known right. Brene Brown before she, you know, that dare to lead, you know, being vulnerable. Um, I've actually, um, thank you, Brene, because I've actually used some of that wisdom when I've actually had own critics come at me uh, in various meetings where, you know, I can't believe that we haven't gotten to success faster. I can't believe blah, blah, blah. I mean, I've had very bold conversations if our goal was to be perfect when we first got out of the door, when we launched something new, then I can't imagine how Silicon Valley would have ever have launched new startups because, in, I mean, there's, you know, the creativity when you're, when you're critical, and especially like as, as Brene would say, you know, when you're on the bleachers criticizing of people in the arena, you really have no place. And I think you have to have that confidence, especially with individuals that, you know, may, may be just critical because maybe it reflects their own personal brand. Maybe they don't know themselves what you're up to. Maybe that's just the way they've been trained. Um, but I think it's um, been, you know, those individuals that I've either watched or like I've mentioned many times, mentors, you know, being so intentional about the people that you seek out to help you grow in areas that you know you want to develop. And, you know, how does that kind of pattern match with individuals that you really admire and, and the path that you want to see yourself on? I think those are great insights. And I think I think everyone would agree. We wish we'd all had that information a little bit sooner so we could leverage yeah. it to our advantage. Um, now, listen, obviously, you're not done growing right? And evolving and you're not done solving problems. So how do you continue to invest in your growth mindset? So what are the things that you're doing daily, weekly, or monthly that invest in your personal growth and development? 
So even just by the choices I make career wise, I feel like that's, you know, helping me with that. Knowing that my North Star always is solving problems, being innovative and in leadership roles. And I've, I've never stopped that path. And to the extent that I feel like I'm getting bored, I start looking for something different. Um, so, you know, to the extent that I can actually help, I see a gap, I see an opportunity. What is it that we can go do to fill that gap? Um, I'm working on building out a very robust executive sponsor program that is novel and it's exciting. It's going to develop, you know, leaders, and executives of the future. Um, but that gets me excited, building something new, new problems to solve, reaching out to others. How are we doing it today? Reaching out to people outside of Oracle. How are companies doing this today? Um, that's one aspect of it. Just always having new assignments and having things that really just kind of, you know, challenge you to think differently. But quite frankly, talking to our customers, my goodness, you know, those of us in customer facing roles all have that opportunity every single day because companies, you know, employees of those companies, leaders of those companies are constantly challenged with, you know, new things that they need to go do. And so they're going to challenge you. You know, you're going to be asking them what you need to be doing to help them and help support their success. They're going to challenge you. They're going to tell you, they're going to, you know, help you be thinking about things that you need to problem solve for them. Um, even being able to give the gifts of things that we've already solved at Oracle and helping my customers that I, you know, I'm, personally sponsor, helping them solve those challenges is inspiring and creative to me. Um, also just being intentional with one-on-ones, Christy, you know, never, you're never done networking. You're never done growing your network and just continuing to be intentional about it. I know that there's somebody that's doing something really interesting that relates to what I'm trying to do or something I might be interested in the future. How can I connect those dots? How can I learn what they're doing? Um, and just constantly just have a growth mindset around you're never done learning, Christy. That is for sure. And you've given us so many nuggets of wisdom and I am so grateful for that. But I got to I gotta end on a high here. Yeah. So before we wrap up our episode, what's the one thing you want to leave our listeners with? What can they take away from today's conversation? Yep. Absolutely. So here's kind of the catchphrase. What one woman can do, another can do. Okay. And yes, we all have unique strengths. We all have unique gifts, but one, one woman can do, another can do. You can overcome your inner critic. What one woman can do, another can do. You can develop your personal brand so that you're visible, that people see the unique superpower that you have in you. What one woman can do, another can do. You can network. You can find amazing mentors and sponsors. What one woman can do, another can do. Everything around getting into the C-suite, all the things that you know, we've already talked about, Christy, developing that executive presence, you know, yeah. taking on those stretch assignments, walking in that door, what one woman can do, another can do. And we need to help remind women of that, support them, lift them up and help them walk through the door. Oh my gosh. I feel like, I feel selfish in the sense that I feel like this podcast, I feel like I just took so much wisdom from it. And I know that I'm going to be able to take this as I continue to grow myself as a leader and a professional. I, Catherine, I am so grateful for the time that we've had today. And I thank you so much. Your journey has truly been inspiring. Not only what you've done at your time at Oracle, but your entire, you know, professional career, all the folks that you've had the ability to impact. And I know that all of our listeners today will, will find so much joy in listening to your story today. So thank you so much. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you so much for the platform. This is amazing, Christy. I am a big fan of everything you're doing and um, look forward to continuing the conversation. I'm so grateful. Well, listen, everyone, if you've enjoyed this episode, please rate and follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, subscribe on YouTube, and connect with me on LinkedIn. Until next time, we'll see you soon. Hi, guys. I want to share a bit about an organization that I support called Wednesday Women. They're on a mission to increase the visibility of executive women leaders that you should know, learn from, and be inspired by. On LinkedIn, they share the profile of two amazing women each week on Wednesdays, of course. And now just imagine if we all followed, amplified, and nominated the women that we want to see more of. Their initiative provides examples of women CEOs, founders, sales executives, technical leaders, and so many more. By supporting Wednesday Women, you'll see more of these professionals in your social feeds, of course, but also on stages, podcasts, and panels. If you're interested in learning more and supporting their initiative, head over to www.wednesdaywomen.org or follow them on LinkedIn.